And uh, that is close to the promised land up in that area now. So people say George is the promised land. So, well, the further north you go, the better it gets. <laughs> But uh, anyhow, he's been, he's been up there all his life and uh, pastoring a church there in Calhoun, Salem Baptist Church. And I, when was the first time I came up there? Was it like 2020, actually? <laughs> yeah, so I came up there and he asked me to do a conference on the book of Hebrews, uh, doctrinally, rightly divided. So on Saturday, you know, I did like four or five lessons, I think, uh, dealing with the doctrine of Hebrews uh, concerning the 70th week of Daniel and all of that. So that shows you where his church is at, if they can handle that. And they took it well. <laughs> I mean, that's some strong stuff to talk about. And so he's done a great job teaching them the word rightly divided and uh, been up there ever since every year. I appreciate him letting me come. He's one of the few that lets me come back. I've preached a lot of places once. <laughs> But uh, we've been friends. I appreciate his ministry, appreciate his family and how they are faithful in the Lord's work, doing a great job up there. And he's been here before, but it's been a little while, so I'm glad. He's very busy with uh, all that he's got going, and I appreciate him being able to make time to come. And uh, um, So that was a great meeting. I think the only problem was it was the opening day of rifle season. I don't know why. I'm thinking, what do we... But anyway, he, he hasn't done that again since then, right? Uh, but um, I, we're looking forward to hearing him. Brother Elrod, if you would come on up, and um, and uh, we'll turn it over to, to... Did you, by the way, I forgot, did you give them the thumb drive and all that? I did. Okay, good. All right, we're good to go. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right, good evening. If you would, take your Bible and be find the book of Jude, the book of Jude in one hand, and I would like for you to mark... 2 Timothy chapter 3 with the other. It is a pleasure to be here with you this evening, Hope Bible Church. I consider this my second church. I do pastor a church, but I'm sure that your pastor has told you before that pastors need to be preached to as well. And so uh, I consider your pastor my pastor, uh, just uh, a little bit further south here. And I appreciate uh, getting to meet Brother Stephen. I talked with him on the phone. I've heard him preach several times through different uh, avenues there in Bible conferences, and Eric was up there at our church uh, back last summer, and so it was good to see him, and good to see many familiar faces from the last time we were here. Um, we are very busy, but everybody's busy, amen, and so uh, I was looking forward to coming down here with you. David told me last time I had to cancel, uh, he showed me no sympathy. I had a sick child, uh, you know, and he said, I can't believe you're not coming down here, you know. Uh, I've got three boys. Two of them are back there. Uh, Landry is eight, and Lawton is six, and Lucas is with my wife, Samantha. He's two. He just turned two in September. Uh, but then he told me, he said, if you cancel on me this time, uh, you're done. He's, he's writing me off. And lo and behold, Monday, I had my wisdom teeth taken out. And I thought, Lord, I need some help. I've got to go uh, to Hope Bible Church, or he's going to write me off. Uh, but praise the Lord, I feel much better, and uh, I'm glad that we're here, and I'm glad we've got the Word of God tonight. And I want to speak to you on this subject, certain corruption, certain corruption. And they're going to pop up a graphic here in just a moment, and uh, you can have that with you. And it'll kind of be the outline of what we're going to talk about here tonight. And several things that were mentioned this morning, uh, I'll kind of uh, just... Uh, touch on those. I was worried that Stephen was about to get on my sermon uh, at, at the close of his uh, this morning. It was some fantastic Bible preaching. Uh, but I, I do want to talk to you about that here from God's Word. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and then Jude. Let's go ahead and just start here in the book of Jude and work our way through here. I am used to having a lapel. I'm not crazy about the one I have. Uh, it's one of those headsets, you know, you don't know if you're calling a play or flying a helicopter or whatever or preaching, but I have to wear it because the sound booth tells me that's what i got to wear. But I, I move, so I'm telling y'all, this is what's going to happen. And here in just a little bit, you're going to see, I'm going to move right and left, but I'll get back in the middle. I'll get, I'll get tuned in here uh, and, and, and everything, but I, I am thankful to, to be here preaching the Word of God here with you tonight on a Saturday night. This is the most important thing going on in the state of Georgia tonight. Amen? This is it. This is it. 20 years from now, nobody's going to remember who won between Georgia and Kentucky or if the Braves won in game one against the Phillies. But hey, this matters what we're doing here tonight. Amen. I'd rather be here than between the hedges. All right. The book of Jude, let's start in verse number four. 
Jude in verse number four. The Bible says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to pay a special attention to verse four where it says, Certain men crept in unawares. Certain men. Now, Jude goes on to, to talk about a lot of things, and we understand, again, the, the purpose of the book of Jude, and we understand what it means to rightly divide the word of truth, but as we also come to realize that we can learn from everything that there is in the Bible, and so we're going to try to make some practical applications uh, from the book of Jude and 2 Timothy and other places here this evening. Drop down to verse number 7, same, uh, same book, verse number 7. He says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You don't hear much today about eternal vengeance and fire from Almighty God. But he still is a God that will, will pay and recompense vengeance on the ungodly. That's still the God of the Bible. Go look there in verse number 8. He says, Likewise also these filthy dreamers, now that's the certain men that crept in and awares, defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak. Now, notice this word speak as we go forward here. Speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, uh, The Lord rebuked thee. But these, again, look what it says, speak. Evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beast. In those things, they corrupt themselves. So tonight we're talking about certain corruption. Certain corruption. They corrupt themselves. Now verse 11 is going to be our launching verse. And then we're going to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and see what Paul has to say. And then we're going to get into the message. Woe unto them. That's the certain men. Those, those, those are the same uh, characters that he's been describing here. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, that's one, and ran greedily after the era of Balaam for reward, that's two, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor, or Kor there in the book of Numbers, that's three. Now, hold your place here, and I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Certain men. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and let's just start there in verse number 6. 2 Timothy 3, 6, Paul says, actually back up to verse number 5, having a form of godliness. That's essentially what Jude has been describing uh, for a different dispensation, but that's essentially the same thing. He says, they have a form of godliness. Now Paul says concerning the last days that no doubt you and I live in, they're perilous times. But he says there will be a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. What do you do with this crowd? You turn away from it. The Bible says that we need to abstain from the very appearance of evil. But then he says this, for of this sort, Jude says that there were certain men, they crept in and away. Paul says, for of this sort are they which... Creep. See that same word, don't you? Now, kids today are different. I teach high school, and this is my 14th year in education. I've taught middle school, but most of my time in education has been in high school. And I'm always about three years behind the times when it comes to the vocabulary that kids use. You know, slang words, and I'm like, drip, what is that? You know, and they use all these words. And so you remember, maybe, I don't even know if kids say this anymore, but so-and-so would be a, a creep. You're a creep. That would not be a term of endearment that you would use for somebody, right? And so you, you think about that term that Jude, he says, they crept in unawares. Paul says, he says, they creep into houses. Listen to me tonight, Christians. And I pray and... I have no reason not to think that everybody's in here uh, a saved uh, believer. They've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. I don't know that. God knows that. But I can tell you this. If you're saved, listen to me. The devil's not through with you. 
This world system's not through with you. He wants you just as much today as he did when he had you in his system. And so he's trying to get in your house. He's trying to get in your house individually. And can I say this for Hope Bible Church and these other churches that are represented? He wants to get into your church house. And Paul says, they're going to creep into houses. They lead captive, silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I'm not going to have you turn to the passage I'm about to reference. I would like you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, as you see here on the screen, the mystery of iniquity. We find that phrase in Paul's epistles in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul tells us something about the mystery of iniquity. He says that it doth already work. Now, what you and I realize as we live in the dispensation of the grace of God. And by the way, we do live in the dispensation of the grace of God. I'd rather live today than in the Garden of Eden. Amen. And so that's where we find ourselves. But here's something else that we find out through Paul. That there's something going on that was already in existence before the dispensation of the grace of God came on the scene. And listen, it'll still be here when the dispensation of the grace of God leaves the scene. It's called the mystery of iniquity. So you and I, though we are in the dispensation of the grace of God and we're sealed into the day of redemption, we've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, there's something that we better be ready for. It's the mystery of iniquity. Look what he says here in Ephesians chapter number 2. Look in verse number 1. Now, I'm going to speak here about the world, the flesh, and the devil. I do teach social studies. I teach U.S. history. And so as we, we go through our standards and we try to teach history in a chronological order, you get to the place to where uh, you bring up the Axis powers. Y'all remember that from school, the Axis powers in World War II. And so that group of three nations by three world leaders, the Axis even George W. Bush, later on in his administration, he referenced the axis of evil, if you remember that speech that he gave. And so these, these terms that, that we have uh, come accustomed to in history and politics, well, the Bible says that we also have enemies. And they are the world, the flesh, and the devil. That's all a part of this mystery of iniquity program. Look what he says in Ephesians 2, verse number 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Those are the children of Adam. That's who we were before we trusted Christ as our Savior, according to Romans chapter 5. Wherefore, as by one man disobedience, many were made sinners. Even so, by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Amen? And so... Verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so again, you see the world there in verse number 2. He says, according to the course of this world. You see there the flesh in verse number 3. He says, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, and then you see the devil mentioned there in verse 2, the prince of the power of the year, and there's a reference as there, and were by nature the children of wrath. What did Jesus tell those Pharisees over there in John chapter 8? He says, ye are of your father the devil. Spiritually, their father was the devil. We become a child of God, Galatians 3.26, by faith in Christ Jesus. Amen? And so we see all three of these here at work. Now, with that foundation, I say that foundation, I assume that everybody in here, you've seen these scriptures, you've got an understanding of this. But what I want to show you tonight as we consider Jude, we're going to go back to the book of Jude, and we're going to see three individuals that I believe we see the embodiment of the world, the flesh, and the devil working out in those experiences, as Jude says, these are set forth as an example for you and I. You say, preacher, I'm saved and on my way to heaven. Praise God for it. He still wants you. He still wants you. He wants you to lose your testimony. He doesn't want your family to know what we're talking about tonight. And if you ever expect to live a victorious Christian life in your experience, we better get a good grip of what's going on in the world today. Now, go back to the book of Jude. Jude... 
uh, in verse number 11. And let's look at this one verse, and then we'll turn to several places here this evening, and then I'll be done. Look there again in verse number 11. He says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran gridly after the era of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Now, take your Bible, and I want you to find Hebrews chapter 11. I'm not going to have you turn to 1 John. I'm going to try to save you some flipping here tonight. 1 John 3, verse 12, as you're, good, as you're finding Hebrews chapter 11, tells you about Cain, that he was of the wicked one and he slew his brother. Why? Because his brother's deeds were righteous and his were evil. We find that obviously over there in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 4. Now Hebrews 11, and let's look here in verse number 1. Hebrews 11, 1. There are essentially two religions in the world today. Now, you're thinking in your mind, well, I know that there's more than two because I've had uh, social studies myself. We studied world history and world religions and all this other stuff. Well, according to the Bible, there's only two. My brother just got back uh, from serving in the country of India. He was a church plant missionary over there in New Delhi, India, a place that was steeped in religion, Hinduism and other things. And uh, you think about Hinduism and uh, Islam and all these other world religions that they tell us is out there, but there's really only two, and we see them right here. Look what it says here in Hebrews 11, verse number 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good report, through faith we understand. That's, that's the key to understanding your Bible right there outside of rightly dividing the word of truth. By faith we understand. This is why we must approach God's word through the avenue of faith. That the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made by, or excuse me, of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So there's our two brothers. First John 3 says that Cain was of uh, the wicked one. He, uh, he says here he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. There's two ways out there in the world. You can go by the way of Abel, which is by faith, or you can go by the way of Cain, which is by your works. The way of faith and Abel will always be accepted on the grounds of what God has said that you need to do. That's the wonderful application of the book of Hebrews, especially chapter number 11. It's about faith. By faith Noah, being warned of God as things not seen, prepared. That's what he did, amen. He prepared, why? Because he believed it by faith. By faith, you and I must believe that when God sent his son on the cross, that he died for our sins, that he was buried, and he rose again without our sins for our justification. You believe that, he gives it to you as a free gift. We do it by faith. And so you can go by the way of faith, Abel, or you can go by works. There's only two ways that you can go. And so the way of Cain is religion. It is religion. Take your Bible real quick, and I want you to go to 2 Peter. Go to 2 Peter real quick. It is religion. It's doing it their way. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Let's just be honest. Most of the time, what we think is the right way or the right thing usually is not right. Ladies, I gave you an opportunity to give a good camp meeting, shouting hallelujah, amen. Your husband's sitting right beside you. You say, I told you so. <laughs> Most of the time, what we think is not right. That's why we, we put so much of an emphasis on renewing our mind by what? Fox News, CNN? No, but by the Word of God. This has got to transform our thinking. This has got to have our passion, our motive uh, about what we think and believe. But look in 2 Peter chapter 2, look in verse 
number one. Second Peter two one. We're going to be coming back to Second Peter chapter two here in just a little bit. If you want to just put something there, but it says this. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Now listen to me. We know where Second Peter is, and we understand that. But again, as we said, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Would you believe that there's false teachers and prophets in America today in twenty twenty three? Now, you believe that, and I do too. Go ask the next hundred Christians you meet if so and so is a false prophet. We equate buildings to blessings. We equate followers and money to the smile and approval of God on someone's ministry. Don't be that gullible, don't be that ignorant. I've just come to realize this. If we are still in a small minority of people, and we are, we're in good company. Amen. We're in good company. I preached a message uh, at our church, uh, the blessing of being in the minority. And there's a doctrine of being in the minority all the way through the Word of God. Now listen to me. In the end, we're going to be in the majority, but we're not there yet, are we? No and his family, they were the minority. They came out the majority, though, didn't they? Them he three, uh, those three Hebrew boys over there, the whole kingdom's bowing down and worshiping, and they say, we're not going to do it. It worked out pretty good for them too. Amen. Those that went over there spied out the land, those 12 deacons that went over there, amen? <laughs> I love my deacons. I got some good ones, amen? There was two of them came back, said, let's go do it. They got to go in, them 10 didn't. The minority is right. The truth will always be in a small minority. Elijah, you can keep going on and on in the Word of God. But listen, there'll be false teachers. There were among them. They're among us. They'll continue to be here. Who proudly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. Isn't it amazing? The love of our Savior that people get up week after week after week and speak against His death, speak against Him shedding His blood, speak against His all-sufficient sacrifice, and yet He died for them too. What love, what salvation is available through Jesus Christ. He says, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Religion. Listen to me, this world's religious. This place, this is the first time, Brother David, that I've actually kind of got to drive around the area. As we were leaving the church this morning, it took us a, a different route to the hotel than when we came in. And it, I think it took me a different route to get here uh, this evening. I was, I was hoping I'd end up at the right place. But here is very similar to where I'm at. There's churches everywhere. Matter of fact, we hit a stretch down through there. I think it was on 16, State Road 16 or something like that. Not 16 like you coming from Macon to Statesboro. That's the longest road in America, and I hate being on that one. But on a different 16 right over there, and I think there was, uh, I mean, you could just take your pick. It was Baskin Robbins over there, man. It was, it was Catholic. It was Jehovah's Witnesses. It was three Baptist churches. It was a church of Christ. It was, and I thought, my goodness. God is not the author of confusion. And it's no different where I'm at. It's no different where. And in, if you've been in the South for any length of time, you know what I'm talking about. Listen, we've got churches. Got churches. We've got religion. Not a lot of truth being preached. Mystery of iniquity. Never forget it. And I know you've heard it from your pastor, but listen, Satan's not at the bar stool tonight. He's not over there in Las Vegas walking the streets. Hey, they're doing that to themselves. He's behind pulpits. He's writing books. He's writing for Lifeway. Amen? I know what I'm talking about. We used to be part of the Southern Baptist Convention. We used to be. Amen? I know what I'm talking about. And it is about money. One of y'all said it this morning. It's about money. It may have been Chase. I don't know, but it is. Profit. You're right, it is. Religion. Number two, the flesh. Let's just stay right here in 2 Peter chapter 2. Go, go, to, the, go to verse number 10. David, I usually look and see what time I started, but I didn't look tonight, so you're going to have to give me the 12-minute warning. Second Peter chapter 2, Look, go there to uh, verse number 10. Second Peter 2.10. So the world is primarily going to use religion to blind the, the masses. 
The way of Cain works, 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 works. Not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Second Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 10, look at the flesh. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government, presumptuous are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. That's what you read over there in the book of Jude too, wasn't it? Whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. You read that over in the book of Jude too, didn't you? But these, as natural brute beasts, you read that over there in the book of Jude, made to be taken and destroyed, speak. Here it is again. And it's amazing to me, and I've heard it, and it's, it's always encouraging to me when I hear other preachers say stuff that I've said or that other people have said to me about, well, I don't like the way someone said that, or I don't like their delivery, or they, they joke too much, they don't joke enough, they use too many illustrations, they don't use enough, they wear a tie, they don't wear a tie, <laughs> they preach too long, you got to preach longer. I'm telling you, it's, it's a sight. <laughs> and listen, people get called up on everything else. It's all about the sizzle and not the steak most of the time in most churches. It's not about the substance. I think it is here. Praise God for it. I'm just saying we, we don't need to have that attitude when it comes to things of God. What, you know how I judge someone? What they say. What they say. It's about what they're saying. Now, personally, it doesn't mind me. Hey, I grew up. I grew, I grew up. Y'all have heard of hacking before. I'm not talking about like you, you know, you, I'm talking about preachers. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I can't do it, so don't worry. I'll get David to do it in a little bit. <laughs> but they'd get up there, and, and it, they'd always wear a suit and tie, and it wouldn't be 15. I mean, they're, I mean, before you know it, they're talking about monster, and they're about half naked up there preaching. <laughs> Jackets off, shirts undone. Th- what in the world's going on, right? Don't sit on the front row unless you got a poncho either. And I've been hit so many times and I'd be too afraid to wipe it off my face. I'm afraid the preacher would say something. Now that's the type of church I grew up in. Very sincere people, genuine people. Love me and love my family. All right, I'm not saying anything about it against the individual. But that's the type of style of preaching in church that I grew up in. That was it. And listen, I was in my teens. I was 15 or 16 years old. And I got invited to go to a, a church service with a friend of mine. And the guy gets up here, and I didn't know it at the time, but it was probably the first real Bible message I'd ever heard in my life. And we got done. He got done talking, and we got ready to leave. And I literally thought in my mind, nobody preached today. Because the guy didn't get up there, get red-faced like he was about to have a heart attack, and scream, and spit, and snot, and hack, and, and you know, sit or so-and-so, shout her down. I mean, I didn't even think I went to church. Amen. So listen, it doesn't bother me. Different stuff doesn't bother me one bit. I can take it if it's right. If it's what they're saying is right. People get worked up about that stuff. Listen, these speak evil of things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Certain corruption, certain men, here it is. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. Now, remember that of the flesh. Remember that of the flesh. It tells you they have ran after the era of Balaam. Now, let's continue reading here. You'll get to it in just a second. Spots. Just skip on down to verse. Let's just go to verse number 14. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. I believe that's what Paul is talking about over there in Ephesians 4, that we're not going to be tossed to and fro. Man, we need some, we need some steadfast, stable Christians in our hour. Amen. Can I tell you this? I guess everybody, I don't know, I may be one of the youngest in here. I bet you're probably younger than I am. you got more hair than I do. But you know what this young man needs to see and my young men need to see? They need to see some mamas and daddies and grandmas and grandpas that are stable and steady in the faith. That's what they need to see. That's what they need to see. 
Beguiling unstable souls a heart that they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children and forsaken. Here it is, forsaken the right way. They ran greedily after the era of Balaam. Now Balaam's over there, you read it in Numbers 22 through 25. Look what it says. It tells us this. It's a built-in commentary. Are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Besor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He was a prophet, all right. He was looking to profit out of the work of God. Take your Bible real quick. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now look what Paul has to say. Something very similar along these lines. I think it's a fantastic thing to take care of people in the ministry financially. Hear me. you got a pastor that preaches the Word of God, you need to take care of them. Amen. Amen. I think it's great we've got some men writing books on uh, books of the Bible and study notes on the Bible. I think that's wonderful. I think they need to be compensated for it. Absolutely. Amen. But listen, we are not in the ministry for dollars. Those are hirelings, and that's what he was. And they're a dime a dozen. I know some Baptist preachers, they wouldn't dare take a church without first seeing their financial statement. Shame on them. Shame on them. And they'll have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ too. And I think a church needs to do what they can and take care of things, and I, I believe that that's biblical. First Timothy chapter 6, look in verse number 6, 5. Not 65, verse number 5. If you've got 1 Timothy 6, 65, see me after the service. Perverse disputings of men of, here it is, corrupt minds. And destitute of the truth. Supposing. See, this is what people think. They're supposing, here's what the average person out there thinks. That gain is godliness. Joel Osteen, David's first cousin, gets to... <laughs> You've never heard that one before, have you? <laughs> I think he uses the old Houston Rockets arena. Is that, is that right? I think twenty to 25,000 probably that thing will hold. I'll never preach to that many in person. Now, the good thing about what you guys have here in your internet ministry... I'm t hey, that's, you'll get to reach a lot of people. And that's a fantastic thing. But imagine it. Listen, let's say 20,000 in person, and then he's on TV, and he's on radio, and he's reaching multitudes of people. And you think, their average person, well, this guy's got to, you know, obviously, God has blessed him. Obviously, look at all these things. Look at Andy Stanley. He has... You know, 15 satellite churches. And I mean, look at all these things. Supposing. Supposing. Gain is godliness. In the words of Lee Corso, not so fast, my friend. That's not how it works. Look what he says. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to many foolish and hurtful us, which drown men in destruction and perdition. What's another name for the Antichrist? He's the son of what? Perdition. Mystery of iniquity doth already work. Hey, if he can't get you to be religious, he'll get you to chase after the riches of this world. Luke chapter 12, Jesus says, Thou fool. The man that was going to build bigger and greater. I mean, the big building project. He said, you're a fool. Tonight your souls required of thee. So is he that's not rich towards God. He says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and snare to many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in perdition, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Not having money, it's the, the love of money. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. The era of Balaam. They've erred from the faith. Listen, I'm not any better than anybody else. I'm not naive enough to think there's been far better preachers, far better fathers, far better husbands, far better men than I am that have fallen into one of these three categories at some point in their life. 
And you and I, we better get a healthy dose of that ourselves. Let every man take heed lest he fall. I'm not above it and you're not either. This thing is real about this mystery of iniquity. I promise you this, the adversary, he doesn't want me going back to Salem Baptist Church and continuing on in the ministry. He doesn't want me raising my three boys in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He doesn't want me as a husband leading my family in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He doesn't want it for me and he doesn't want it for you either. He's not going to get me to be religious. Well, he may get you to chase after money. And I'll tell you what he uses. Hey, this, this American dream... It has fell right in the middle of it, hasn't it? They don't get it in the church. That's all we tell our kids. I told ours one day, I said, listen, we, we've idolized the wrong group of people in our churches. Go in the vast majority of churches and say, I want you to tell me about King James or something. If you just mention King James, you know what they're going to say? LeBron. <laughs> Amen. They will. I got to speak to our High school football team. I, I, I serve as the athletic coordinator, but our church did the pregame meal, and I got to speak to them, and, and I got to talk about Noah. Told them that the rain's coming, ready or not. Got to preach the gospel to them yesterday. You know what I realized? Listen, I'm telling you, looking around there, most of those kids, they've never heard of Noah. And listen, northwest Georgia, that's the buckle of the Bible belt. They don't know what we're talking about. These stories that we just come accustomed to in our society, listen, those days are over. We idolize the wrong people. Chase money, chase careers, chase politics and professional sports. What has a professional athlete ever done for you? Nothing. Nothing. Look what he says. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some covet out, they have erred from the faith. They've been knocked off course and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You better watch out for the riches of this world. Heir of Balaam. Finally, and I'm done. The devil. Rebellion. Go to the book of Numbers. Go to the book of Numbers. Gainsaying of court. I have no idea how long I've been, but I'm going to wrap this up. Book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 16. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Now understand the devil, he'll use those first two. He is over the mystery of iniquity. Using the world system, the course of this world. The flesh, we understand all that, how they, they tie in together, but they are distinct as well. But in number 16, look in verse number 2. Number 16. Now remember in Jude 11, this is the gainsaying of Kor. Now it says in verse number 2, he says, and, and, and they rose up before Moses was certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous. Aren't you so impressed? In the congregation, men of renown. That's 250. Boy, they're in the majority. This is the who's who. This is the city council, right? This is the board. They got everybody together. They gather themselves again, uh, together against Moses and against Aaron. Said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Wherefore... Then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. You see what they're doing here? They're bringing an accusation against this, these two men that they didn't think of themselves. Y'all think you're better than everybody else because of your position. Who put them two men in that position? God did. God's the one that says, this is my man. This is the one I'm speaking of and I'm speaking through and you better listen to them. We've talked about this before. People don't have a problem. They get that about Moses. I wonder why they don't get that about Paul. 
Could there be something behind the scenes that's working on their mind not to get it about Paul? Because the, the enemy knows if they'll ever get what God was doing through Paul, they'll get some other things that Paul wrote and they'll be saved, they'll have assurance, and they'll be effective in the ministry. You better believe this is working today. You're putting too much on yourself. Lifting yourself above the congregation. Look what the humility and the meekness of Moses. When Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. Let me tell you something. You read over there where Moses made intercession for the people and he prayed for God was going to wipe them out, wasn't he? And Moses prayed for them. I'll be honest with you, there's sometimes I find that hard. Now y'all can take y'all's halo off, slide it all the way under your seat where I can't see it. Listen, I find that hard sometimes. You know what i got to possess to have the same mind and motive that Moses had? We better have the mind of Christ on that thing. Amen. Amen. Go to verse number 5. He spake unto Korah and all this company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are His and who is holy. Cause Him to come near even to Him whom He hath chosen. He will cause to come near unto them. Go to verse 9. He says, Seem it but a small thing unto you, that the Lord God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel. They, they were Levites. They had a special position. But you know what? They wouldn't satisfy with the lot that God gave them. What did 1 Timothy 6? But godliness with contentment is great gain. They wouldn't satisfy. They wouldn't content with what God had done for them. Service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. Brought them near to him and all the brethren, the sons of Levi with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also. For which cause both thou and all thy company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that ye murmur against him? What did Paul say over there concerning the churches that he ministered to? Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Backbiting, devouring, read Galatians 5. Amen. Now, go to verse number 16. I'm almost done. Actually, I'm sorry, verse number 26. Now again, we're talking about rebellion. Mystery of iniquity, the devil. You have in Ezekiel 28, don't turn there, you've, you've read it before. Ezekiel 28. God talking about Lucifer, king of Tyrus, using him. But he says, thou was perfect in the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. He was lifted up with pride because of his beauty. And what did he do? He led a rebellion. He led a rebellion. He's the original rebel is what he is. You know what God's going to do to the nation of Israel over there in the book of Ezekiel when he comes back to the second coming? He's going to purge the land of all the rebels. Rebellious. We're never more like the devil then we're rebelling against God-given authority. Look what he says, verse number 26. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. Go to verse 31. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder, that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. Go to chapter 17, verse number 10. Coming down the stretch, I'm almost done. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept for a token against the who? Rebels. Why? And thou shalt quite uh, take away their. And amazing. This whole thing got started. Let's say in Lucifer's case, the rebellion started in heaven. God said, Use perfect in how I created you. I set you in a position. Get this. Lucifer had a position outside the Godhead that no creature in the universe had. But it wasn't good enough. 
pride, destruction, he falls, he comes down to the earth. And what does he do? He tempts the woman, he deceives her, he beguiled her to kill somebody? No. To steal something? No. Rob a bank? No. Rebelled. Yea, hath God said. We talked about a diet today. We walked in that room today. You know, the Bible says we're to singing spiritual songs in our heart. I saw that dessert table and the song that entered into my inner man. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. <laughs> She took of that fruit and ate it. But the rebellion started long before, right there. The world, the flesh, the devil. Eric hit the nail on the head. He talked about the heart. I don't know all the, you said in the message, I was driving, had them two in the back seat. I was coming through Atlanta, but I caught enough of that. It's a matter of the heart. The mystery of iniquity is after us. You're saved by the grace of God. You're sealed unto the day of redemption and there's nothing that the devil, you, the world, or flesh can't do anything about it. That's true. That's true. But listen to me. We've got to be aware. We've got to be active. We've got to be alert. Religion, riches, rebellion. God help us individually and within a local assembly to be a place that that stuff doesn't have any room to fester. I'll say this and I'm done. Brother David, you come on up here. There's been, there's been many churches, many good works that have gone on in the name of the Lord that have been destroyed from within because somebody wouldn't get enough credit, because some family wouldn't get their due, because somebody might have been asked to do something that somebody else didn't get to do. Listen to me, that stuff's of the devil. That stuff's of the devil. We better keep our eyes on the prize, folks, and the prize is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I appreciate your time. Heavenly Father, I love you tonight. I thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate these people being very attentive to the Word of God. God, I pray that you would allow these truths to sink down deep in our inner man, knowing, God, that salvation is free, and we Rejoice in that tonight. We stand in that tonight. We also know that as we walk by faith, not by sight, that there's enemies out there. There's enemies within. And I pray that you'd give us the discernment, God, the, the, the spiritual wisdom that we need through your word uh, to live a life of victory. Not only, God, to bring glory to your name, but to be a help and a blessing to other people that you want to place in our realm of influence God, we ask that sincerely tonight. I, God, I do pray that you'd be with the rest of the meeting. I pray that you'd be with the other preachers that's going to come around and bring the word of God, that you'd fill them, use them, uh, all for your honor and for your glory. And God, we thank you tonight. We love you because you first loved us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great Bible message. It's, uh, I tell you, a lot to think about there. And you can't handle the devil in your own power. You've got to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. He made it available, but you've got to put it on by faith. And stand against those wiles and oh, a lot to consider. That's a good warning for us. Let's, um, let's stand if you would. And uh, I'm going to ask Stephen if he doesn't mind to lead us in a hymn. Or, and you're not preaching.
good song in some ways, other ways not so good. <laughs> As one of those, you know, uh, Brother Dave Reese said one time, I remember hearing him preach one time, he said, you know, a lot of preachers spiritualize the Bible. He said, I spiritualize the songbook. Because <laughs> the songbook wasn't given by inspiration of God. And there, you know, I don't nitpick the hymns, but you can pick out sometimes. Where to, but that's a, it is settled. It's settled on the cross by the blood of Christ. And praise the Lord for the truth of that. Amen. Uh, I thought we would um, just take a moment here uh, to, uh, I know we've had folks travel in. If you want to tell us. Your name and where you're from. You want to do that? Yeah, you do. Good. All right.
Rasmus, if he would, to make his way up. He's going to give a brief testimony. There's so much, you know, when you give a testimony, there's so much to say. Uh, and I hate to put constraints on him, but, you know, uh, he understands. And I, I told him, he said, I got the email, he's coming from Sweden. I'm like, sure he is, you know. And I forgot about it. I feel bad about it now because I got busy with things. And then he shows up. I'm like, man, if I would have known for sure you're coming, I would have, you know, put him in the schedule or something, you know. That's, I'm amazed, and it's a tremendous testimony. But he's going to share a little bit with us, and I enjoy talking with him today. Brother Rasmus. Thank you for hosting this uh, conference. It's been a blessing, truly. And all the services you do with this ministry here, everyone that works here and does the work for the Lord, really. Uh, and, well, I haven't found a church like this that really preaches the Word of God and believes the book as much as you do here. So thank you for that. I was asked to... Uh, uh, tell you about my way to faith and how I was saved. Uh, and uh, yes, I'm from Sweden, so I hope I will make myself understood. Uh, I might not find all the words <laughs> all the time, but um, anyway, I haven't been saved for a long time. I'm soon three years ago I was saved. And uh, so I have not been a Christian for that long, and I don't come from a Christian background. Uh, I'm grown up in a totally secular family, and uh, no one in my family believes in God, and I didn't even know a Christian person, uh, none, none in my extended family, and not, not even a friend that was a Christian. Now, Sweden was a Christian country uh, at least a couple of hundred years ago, but uh, since then, it has become one of the most secular countries in the world. Uh, and that is uh, how I was brought up, and I considered myself an atheist my whole life, uh, and especially during my high school, uh, yeah, high school years, I was really an atheist. I thought if you believed in God, that that you were stupid. That's what I thought. Now I don't think that anymore, but <laughs> I know better now. But I've always been interested in truth. I've been a, I'm, I am a curious person, and uh, especially during my high school years, I st studied a lot of you know science. I, I liked to understand how things work, and I thought science could explain everything. And uh, the search for the truth led me to think that, but I wasn't fully satisfied with the answers that science gave me. Science didn't have all the answers. Uh, I didn't realize that then, but. So time went on and I finished high school and you know you grow up and come out to the world and you have to stand on your own legs and, and take care of yourself. And when I did, I didn't know what to do uh, at that age. Uh, so I was a bit humbled, uh, a bit lost. I was lost, but I was a bit lost in the world. Uh, and I humbled myself, okay, there is maybe more things out there in this universe, in this world that I don't understand and that we don't have the answer to. So I started to open up myself a bit to that I didn't have all the answers. And I've always been a reader. I've, I like to read books. I had never read the Bible, though, at that time. So, but I decided that I'm going to read the Bible. I've heard, I knew that the Bible is the most famous book in the world. Uh, and it must have something that, I, that it can teach me. Uh, and I knew I had seen a Bible somewhere in the home, somewhere. Uh, it was down in the basement in the storage area somewhere. It was my dad's old confirmation Bible. Uh, so I found that one totally unopened. He hadn't read it at all. I took, took that Bible and I decided I'm going to read this Bible all the way through, starting at the first, first page. Um, and, and I did. And it took me one and a half years to finish the Bible. I read it quite slowly, but I read it all, and I did not believe the Bible when I started reading it. But the more I read, and the further I got, I realized this isn't just any old book. <laughs> this isn't just a storytelling book like, written by people. It's written by people, but I realized this is the Word of God. This is the truth. And the answers that the Bible gave me those were satisfying. Science didn't satisfy my, uh, my questions, but the Bible did. I realized when I, read, when I had read out the Bible, 
But I, I was a believer. I knew this is the word of God and this is the truth. Now, I, I didn't know anything about rightly dividing the word. I, I couldn't explain anything about the theology behind salvation. <laughs> but I knew enough. I knew that I was a sinner and that I was lost. And it ended up that after reading the Bible, and I, since this, took, this was a long process, it took a long time, I had listened to a lot of sermons, and I started, I mean, things happened parallel to the reading of the Bible. I had started praying also, and I received answers to my prayers that, prayers that I could not deny. So, I mean, it all ended that I was there on my knees in my student apartment, realizing this is true. Uh, I am a sinner and I'm lost and the only thing that can save me is you God. Jesus Christ I believe you are God and that you died on the cross for my sins and there is nothing I can do. Please help me Lord, save me. I didn't know anything more than that um, but I'm, I'm, now I'm here and I'm so glad I'm saved. In the end of the day, I mean much thing, many things can happen in our lives, but in the end of the day, I'm just glad I'm not going to hell. <laughs> I'm so glad that I can be sure of my salvation, that whatever happens, I'm saved. And uh, now I'm also glad that I found uh, a faith in the King James Bible as the final authority and the perfect preserved word of God and the teachings that we have heard these days here and from this ministry. So thank you. Praise the Lord. That's amazing how you know, the power of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit uses His Word to convince sinners that they need salvation and uh, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and saved by grace through faith. And sometimes we think it's up to us and how we present it, but here's a man just read the Bible and the Holy Spirit used it and he got saved. And He uses us, but it's the powers in the Word, it's in the preaching of the cross. And uh, in a short time, three years, uh, starting from square one, he's uh, in talking him to, 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 with him today, we, we talked about a lot of deep things of God. The rate of growth comes at how much you receive the word and get in the book. And it's amazing to see what the Lord's already done in his life. So that was a great encouragement. So praise the Lord. Thank you for sharing that. And um, uh, all right, Pastor Stephen, I already introduced him, so I'm just going to turn him loose on you here. <laughs> You guys on the front row or under the spout where the glory comes out. Amen. <laughs> All right. All right. That was a blessing. Amen. That testimony was just a wonderful, wonderful encouragement. And uh, we can sympathize with uh, some of the situation with him not having Christian influence in his life. But then you look at the blessing of not having to relearn everything now. He gets to learn it right the first time. Amen. Isn't that awesome? So that, that's such a blessing as well. Let's go to Galatians chapter number 6, if you would, with me this evening. And what a great message Brother Drew preached to us. That was just, that was just awesome. And uh, I've, I believe he edified us and built us up in the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I, really, I really appreciated that message. Bless my heart. Galatians chapter 6. And I just wanted to... Look at a few verses with you, starting in verse number six, and, I, and I'm trying to be practical. I always have to try to do that, right? Even though doctrine is practical, right? I've heard you say that many times, but I'd like to just try to encourage you tonight about not being weary in well-doing. And Galatians six, of course, speaks to that. So we'll start reading here in a moment, verse number six. Appreciate the Partons and what Brother Parton had to say. I've heard that story before, and that's a blessing. My Uncle Harvey passed away just it's been about almost two years ago now. And so that's a, that's a sweet memory that uh, uh, Brother Parton has. It uh, reminds me of my uncle. And then also, uh, I, my, my parents were married for 16 years before I was born. So that's kind of different. I'm an only child, and it took 16 years uh, for me to finally come along. My mom used to put a, a, a quilt on my bed, which I don't know why. We didn't ever need that in Florida, you know. <laughs> but what it was was one of those old-fashioned prayer quilts where the ladies in the, in the old country church would... Uh, We'd get together and pray, and they would uh, knit a quilt, and it was a, they were praying for my mom to have a baby one day. And so finally she did. Finally she did. And so I appreciate uh, Brother Parton sharing that uh, testimony tonight. And the Partons, of course, are very special to my wife and I and to our family. So that was just an extra blessing for me. Galatians chapter 6, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Let him... 
that is taught in the word, communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, verse 7, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now this is very simple, but it's, uh, uh, I talked about Romans, Corinthians, Galatians this morning, and we understand the corrective doctrine that God gives. Now I was talking to Brother Chase, you know, when we were, when he was going back to the hotel this afternoon, you know, the, the book of Romans is the faith of Christ. We're supposed to take that in. It's supposed to, it's supposed to go inside of us and, and live out of us. And you go from Romans to Ephesians, that's going from a baby, like or a babe, like we were talking about this morning. I like to say baby sometimes because some people like the word babe, right? I'm a babe, you know. But, <laughs> but going from a baby to a man, a full-grown man in the Lord Jesus Christ, that spiritual maturing and that spiritual understanding. So the Word of God takes you from that immature, baby, childish, like uh, uh, spirituality to a spiritual man. And we know what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 37. People call themselves spiritual, and, and religion and the world has taught us what a spiritual person is. But the Bible gives us a different definition. 1 Corinthians 14, 37, Paul says, If any man think himself a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Amen? And you're not acknowledging Paul as your apostle. Uh, you're telling me you have spirituality in you and you don't even understand who your apostle is? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a problem right there, right there at the, at the get-go. But we understand what, this, what a spiritual man is. He's got the Spirit of God operating in him. And you cannot divorce the Word of God from the Spirit of God. In fact, you need to do the opposite, right? You take Ephesians 5 and Colossians chapter 3, isn't it Colossians chapter 3? And you look at them, it's worded very similar. One's talking about the Spirit of God being in you, right? And then one says, let the Word of God dwell in you richly. And they're both right, because that's how that works right there. Amen. It's the Word of God and the Spirit of God together inside of you. So here we're told in Galatians chapter 6 to not be weary in well-doing. So maybe we should ask ourselves real quick, what is well-doing? And... Uh, and the Bible lays the table for that, so I'll just, I'll just quickly, quickly, generally address that. Uh, you know, I don't even think, you know, sometimes it's silly when someone gets up and defines a word, you already know what it is. I understand that. But just for a biblical basis and a run and start, you know, Psalm 33, 13, the Lord looketh from heaven. He beholdeth all the sons of men. What did he see? The first book of the Bible, Galatians 6, says he looked down and he saw men and the thoughts of their heart were evil continually. As uh, I believe Genesis chapter 6, verse number 5, every imagination and thought of man was only evil. There, there was no room to think about God. And that takes us back to Romans 1, where we were at this morning. Re not retaining God in your knowledge. Now, again, he's our creator. Who, who are we as creation of the creatures to say, you know, you're not really worthy of my, my time, Lord. You, yeah, you made me and everything, and you had a reason for doing that, but... You know what? I got other things to think about. I got other things to do. And that's kind of where you see your whole world and the whole society and the whole mindset of everything today. And even religion doesn't have time for the true God today. That message on the mystery of iniquity was spot on. Spot on. Isn't it sad you got what we call good people that are up to here in the mystery of iniquity? I mean, they are inundated with it and they have no idea, apparently. They are totally caught in the deception. They're, in the, they're ensnared by the devil and taken captive by Adam by his will. But they need to acknowledge the truth which is after godliness and they can get out of that snare. What a blessing that is. God, per eventual, will grant them repentance. Amen. To the acknowledging of the truth is what, what the Bible tells us. But what did God see when he looked down? Well, he saw the wicked. Psalm 10 verse 4 says, The wicked is his proud countenance. In his, I'm sorry, the wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. God looked down and found out that not only is man doing evil works, but he also gives no place in his heart, no place in his mind for his creator. 
And so that gets us basically kind of full circle back to Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, you kind of think about what we were taught as the Romans rode there, and you start in Romans chapter 3, verse number 10, for there is none righteous, no, not one. What is Paul doing? He's quoting, he's quoting David in the Psalms, right? He's quoting Psalm number 14, summarized by Paul there. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now look at it. Let's just go there real quick to Romans chapter 3. And, uh, and uh, we've seen it a million times, but let's look at it in this context of understanding what well-doing is, what good is. Romans chapter 3, verse number 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 11. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. I'll stop reading even though 13, verse 13 goes with the quote. Let's just say it this way. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. That's Psalm 14. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You know, that's the problem. Uh, I don't know about you, but I can look at the world system today, even though I know it's the prince of the power of the air that operates it, but I still in my humanity or my carnal mind, however you want to say that, I look and I say, well, that's good and that's bad. That's righteous and that's evil. You know, that's of God and that's of devil when I need to, I need to put my spiritual eyesight back on. I need to consult my spiritual discernment that God has given us through his word and see that, you know what? That's the devil's world system. And guess what? Even what I have perceived as good in my life, that was also the devil there. Yeah. That's a big eye opener for me. I don't know if, that, uh, if I'm communicating that in a, in a profitable way at all. But... You realize God's not going to come back at the second coming and say, oh, thanks for the world system and everything. I'll just take the throne of it now. You understand he's not going to take the throne of none of this stuff that exists now. He's not going to use any bit of it. You think the corrupt works of the God of this world is suitable for creator God and the true king that has the title deed of the earth, will have the title deed of the earth. He's going to come back at this time and say, thanks for doing all the groundwork for me. I'll take over. I'll take it from here. No, that's not what's going to happen. He's going to burn this place down to the foundations, and he's really going to build back better. It's really going to be for real this time. Amen? Yeah. And none, of this, none of this talk, okay? It's going, to be, it's going to be for real. He's going to establish things reconciled back to the Creator and the purpose that God intended in the first place. I'm excited about that because, yeah, the... The God of this world, we've, we've seen his handiwork for too long. I'm ready for the true God to come on the scene. What a blessing that is. And by the way, he's not going to establish his kingdom of righteousness down here on earth without a new administration in the heavenly places. Aren't you glad to be a part of the body of Christ? Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I think that's great. I, I like that part where it says their place is found no more, right? Michael and his angels made war with the dragon and his angels. And they're not going, it's not like they're, oh, you leave for a couple months and, you know, get, reform yourself and come back. No, their place is found no more. Cast down to earth and the devil knows he has but a short time. That's good stuff right there if you think about it. So what we have is Paul quoting David. This, uh, this passage here is about what really doing good is. And as God looked down, he says, mankind is not doing good. There is none good, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. So from this passage and understanding from God's perspective, he looks down from heaven. He doesn't see men with understanding. He doesn't see men seeking him. They've all gone aside. They've deserted and they've fallen totally away from his purpose. So do you understand in general doing good and these verses in the Bible brings you to the understanding it involves seeking God. Now, I gave you some verses from Acts 17 this morning. I didn't read them all. I was trying to be quick. But you remember that? I don't even remember where it falls down about verse 31 or somewhere around there. But that 
famous verse in Acts 17 where Paul is referring to this as he's talking to all those Gentiles that thought they were so smart, right? Uh, in Athens, Greece, and he's, he's pre- uh, speaking to all the philosophers and educators and all the what you call it's of the day, and he tells them that they should seek the Lord. Because you know that's doing good right there is to seek the Lord. That they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. Can you imagine? I mean, I, I know God is God. He's righteous. He's holy. But isn't it just ridiculous in this sense to see that the creation doesn't value the creator? I mean, it has to be offensive to creator God that his creation does not seek him, but instead ignores him. How many churches are going to have church in the morning? And what they're going to end up doing is ignoring the word of God, which means they're ignoring God. They're going to have all kinds of things to fill their time. They're going to have all kinds of programs. And, you know, I'm, I wish I could say it better, but dog and pony shows. They're going to have all kinds of pomp and circumstance. They're going to have all kinds of things they do. But what about this book right here? This is the very words, the very mind, the very thought, the very purposes of God Almighty. Now, we're in Christ Jesus. We're going to be around as long as God's around. Okay, that's called everlasting life. We ought to be well acquainted with this information right here. We shouldn't be like so many, like the majority, like Preacher Drew said tonight. I'm glad that the minority's right, amen? (laughs) If you're seeking God, you're in the minority, but that's the right thing to do right there. So in general, doing good is seeking God. All right, doing good, helping old ladies across the street, I'm sure that's a great thing to do, but... Seeking God is doing good. So in general, back to Galatians chapter 6, we can say that seeking God equals well-doing. So don't get weary in well-doing. This is a good thing you're doing, amen? Uh, I bet there was a lot of, well, I know there's a lot of work that went on to having this meeting. Uh, Not only Brother David, but so many others. There's things Brother David can do that only Brother David can do. But then there's things that Brother David doesn't want to do. And we wouldn't want him to do it because he wouldn't do a very good job at it. Right? So that that means other people got to do those things, right? And you know what that was? That was well-doing because this is a a meeting like this is really a blessing to people to be able to seek God. Find the truth like some of the testimonies we heard just a little bit ago. Seeking the truth and be built up in that truth and continue in that truth and share that truth with other people. That's awesome. Take that truth to other ones as well. So back to Galatians chapter 6. Verse number nine, it says, and let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, uh, let's just talk about this for a second. The context of Galatians six, we got the communication of the word. I read that to you a moment ago here in verse number six. You got sowing to the spirit instead of the flesh. Uh, why do we need to be sowing to our flesh? Everybody else says someone needs to sow the spirit, right? Might as well be us. And that's the well-doing we we need to do to continue in, not quit. To not quit. And not to be weary while continuing. And and that's why I'm trying to be practical in this sense, you know. Uh, Verses 7 and 8 talk about sowing and reaping. Uh, Sometimes our flesh will get... seems like it gets weary quicker in well-doing than it is in (laughs) wrongdoing. And sometimes people can continue, seem to get their second wind when they're doing wrongdoing and when it's the bad habits of life. But we're talking about the well-doing here. We're talking about seeking God. Uh, I remember the story about a father who he made time every day of his life. Every day that ended in Y, he went to the tavern, okay, at least for a little bit and uh, spent time every day at the local tavern right down from the house. But he was always, of course, warning his son to not drink. He says, this is a nasty habit I have. This is a wrong thing I'm doing. It's just got a hold of me, son, but make sure you never do this. Make sure you don't follow in my footsteps. Don't you ever do this. And then there was a snowy day, one winter, winter day. It was snowy. And on the way to the tavern, the father was almost there, and he, something got his attention. He turned around, and he saw his young son carefully placing his feet in the footprints of his father in the snow. Oh, something clicked inside that man, finally. He'd already been struggling. You understand how some of that works. Something, turned, something flipped inside of him. He turned around. He picked up his son, and he never went back to the tavern again, the story says. Never touched the liquor again. 
You know, that's, a, that's good to get weary in wrongdoing and make a change. But we're talking about don't get weary in well-doing. The Scripture encourages us here. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, just a few pages to our right. Ephesians chapter 4, look at verse 17. Um, we, have an, we have an outer man and an inner man, don't we? It's been mentioned. Verse 17, Ephesians chapter 4. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. How do other Gentiles walk? In the vanity of their mind. Vain minds. Darkened understanding. It talks about it in verse 18. Having the understanding darkened. Being alienated. From the life of God. Now, if you're alienated from the life of God, does that mean the life of God is living through you or you're distant from it, right? It's foreign to you. I mean, that, it, that's still the right way to talk about those words, right? It's foreign to you. It's, you. You're not embracing the life of God. You're not saying, okay, let me put this word in and let God live it out through my life every day. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, my outer man, but Christ liveth in me, right? It's the inner man living. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So that's Romans chapter 6, isn't it? That's Romans chapter 6. God justified us and then he identified us with his Son, placed us in his Son in the death of his son were sanctified were raised to walk in the newness of life this is a new life not this isn't that's not referring to your life one day when you get your glorified body that's talking about right now that's your life right now this is according to god's word this is the life of god and it's for right now verse 19 well, let's, let's finish verse 18 first. It says, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. It almost reminds me of Psalm 1 where you got the standing in this, well, how's it go? The standing, well, you know how it goes, you know. <laughs> first you're walking, then you're standing, then you're sitting. Okay, all right. I could have quoted it, but uh, I mean, come on. All right, but here, what you have here in verse number 18 is you have an understanding that's darkened. And then what do you have? You're distant, you're alienated from the life of God. There's ignorance that's in you. Why? Because this blindness is now in your heart. It's like, that's the wrong process. That's, that's wrongdoing again. Well-doing would be you just flip that thing around. Instead of having your understand, understanding darkened, you go, back to the, you go back to Ephesians chapter 1, and now you have your understanding opened or enlightened your spiritual understanding enlightened what does that do well now you have a understanding that shines the truth of God and the Lord Jesus Christ down into your heart no longer is your heart blind but now Christ is dwelling in your hearts by faith like it says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 17 this all goes together right this is embracing the life of God and then verse 19 again is talking about those that are darkened and alienated and blind in their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But what does it say in verse 20? But ye have not so learned Christ. So you're not to be walking as other Gentiles walk, of verse 17, in the vanity of their mind, with a darkened understanding and a blinded heart foreign, alienated from the life of God. No, what you, you've learned Christ. Now, where'd you learn Christ? Well, probably everything you read before you got to this point right here, right? It's given to you in Romans, right? You got corrected and reproved as you went through Corinthians and Galatians, and here you are in the meat of the word of Ephesians, and what a blessing it is to see that you've learned Christ. And then verse 21 says, If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And here it is, verse 23, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's hard to stop. Let's stop in verse 24. 
There's your sowing and reaping of Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7 and, and verse number 8. You can either sow to your flesh, and what's that going to do? Is it going to produce spiritual fruit in your life, or is it going to produce death? Galatians 5 talks about that, the works of the flesh, does it not? So you can walk after what we call walking after your flesh, walk according to your carnal mind, keep, think, keep thinking the way you th used to think because that just naturally makes sense to you, or you can let your thinking be renewed, your thinking be changed because now you have a new mind. You have the mind of Christ. And now you're not walking after your flesh anymore. You're walking after the Spirit of God. You're embracing the life of God. So that's sowing to the Spirit. What a difference. What a difference. Verse number 7, look at it again, Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 8, Galatians 6, 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. There's the death working in your members. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. Now let me go to the second part, verse number 9, about the weary and well-doing part. Now, if you'll go back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I want to, I'm going to, this seeking God and then, I'll just say it this way, ministering Christ to others. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I think the last verse gives like a fantastic description of ministry. I've heard good definitions of the word ministry before, and some of them are somewhat impressive, but you can't improve upon what the Word of God says, of course. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 24, Paul says, Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Now, wouldn't you call that the best description of ministry ever given? That it's not that we take dominion over your faith. Now, I was taught that for a long time, and I thought that was biblical because I was told it was biblical. And it was my fault for not getting in the Bible and saying it wasn't biblical. Okay? It's not that someone else stands between you and God. And they put a yoke, you know, they put a yoke, most of the time it's the law. And they, and they get you yoked up and they get you pulling in, or they, they command you to pull in the direction they say. No, that's, the scripture says here, a great description of ministry is being a helper of someone else's joy. That, the goal is edification. Yeah. This, isn't, this isn't military boot camp where we got to tear you down to, you know, to your most vulnerable you and build you back up in our image, okay? All right? This is God building you up in his son's image. Amen? Christ being formed in you. How's that happen? Like I said this morning, word by word, man. Truth by truth. Drip and drop and just God, just drink by drink. We've all been made to drink into this one spirit, right? What a blessing that is. And this great description of ministry is that we're helpers of your joy because the goal is seeing you build up in Christ. Christ formed in you, edification. And that, so even when you have to be corrected, correction is administered in a wise way because the goal is to build you up at the end of the day. Build you up in the truth of God. Like I said this morning, a believer being restored to spiritual health like the beginning of Galatians chapter 6 speaks of. Now it says in 2 Corinthians 1.24, the last few words, it says, for by faith ye stand. For by faith ye stand. Now, Romans 10, 17. So then, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So only God has dominion over your faith. Any man or individual that tries to say, <laughs> Put themselves in the position of God and exercise dominion over your faith. Just understand they're, they're out of bounds. They're out of order. God has dominion over your faith. And by faith he stands. And how, what's, what's your faith tied to? Hearing the word of God. Hearing the word of God. It's the minister of Christ. It's his duty to help people find God's word on any given subject. And then encourage them to obey it, to follow it, to continue in it. 
And this obedience to God's word is what really brings joy in the lives of God's people. So again, the best job description ever given of a minister is someone that's a helper of your joy. And it's tied back to the word of God. Amen. I heard David just say this yesterday. He says he talked about the counseling ministry thing and all that stuff that uh, people make and t- talk a whole lot about. True counseling is showing somebody what the Word of God says and then encouraging them to follow what the Word of God says. And if they'll do that, they'll have real joy. And they'll grow up in the Lord. And then the one that's been ministering the Word to them is a helper of their joy because by faith they stand. I think the religion has trained our brains the wrong way when it comes to some of this stuff. But the word of God will help us with that and give us a renewed mind on this. So the point here is if you're ministering in yourself and if you're ministering yourself to other people and in your own strength, you're going to get weary. You're going to get weary. You can try and have good intentions and a, and a and supposed right heart about something. But if you're not doing it God's way, you're not really doing well doing. Amen. You've got to seek God and you've got to be a helper of someone's joy. And by the way, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. The Bible says that. So do not be weary in well doing. Weariness could lead to fainting. Right. And uh, fainting sounds like something women do, but men do this too. Right. It's, it means quitting. Ceasing from what you're supposed to. It's not continuing anymore. So do not get weary in well-doing. Okay? Continue to be a helper of, of helpers of joy, according to what the Word of God calls a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Now, who, de- who determines the season? Amen. Well, that's up to God. Amen. We just got to do our part of being helpers of people's joy, ministering Christ, being stewards of the mysteries of God, like the scripture tells us in the book of 1 Corinthians. So I'll continue on. Go back to verse number 10 of Galatians chapter 6, if you would, please. I kind of tie this verse back to verse 6 as well, but let's look at verse 10. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 10. As we have therefore opportunity... Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. I'll read verse 6 as well. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now, doing good is defined here as communicating the very words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll give you an Old Testament example. I tried to do that this morning and give you an Old Testament history lesson with Israel and then make an application to us in the body of Christ. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 27. 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse number 27. You'll remember this passage, I believe, and verse 27 says, And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us, and he passed on, but stand thou still a while, that I may show thee the word of God. I think we're pretty familiar with that Saul in Old Testament times, right? That Saul that was the uh, Benjamite, that was the first king of Israel. Here this Saul in the Old Testament was shown the word of the Lord and he did fine for a little while until he disobeyed. He did fine for a little while until he rebelled against the word of the Lord. And we could go to that 1 Samuel chapter 13 and I'm sure that's a coincidence with the number 13 being there, verse 13 and 14. And uh, then back then to chapter 15, verse 22 through 23. You know, you have the rebellion of Saul and it's we, we, I think we're pretty familiar with, uh, you know, that his rebellion was as the sin of witchcraft. But I just want to quickly remind you of that Old Testament Saul, because we've got a New Testament Saul to consider as well. He was also a, Benjam, a Benjamite, and we know that. And it's just like you find that Saul in the Old Testament in rebellion against God, in the New Testament book of Acts... God saves a Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. God saves him and gives him his word. 
And that word had previously been a secret, amen? It had previously been hidden God, but he gives the word of God to Saul. What a difference with what that Saul did. Had his name changed to Paul, and I'm telling you what, his life was never the same after that. I marvel at Paul. You know why I marvel at Paul so much? Because he was a man that allowed the Lord Jesus Christ to live through him. Paul was not alienated from the life of God. Paul did not retain. When his name was Saul, he had a darkened understanding. When his name was Saul, he had a blind heart. Right? But God did something, amen? God gave him his word. God showed him and revealed himself to him. And I'll tell you what, his understanding was opened and enlightened. And that light shined all the way down, like it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, shined all the way down into his heart. You know what? Paul realized that he was dead to sin and alive unto God. <laughs> and the life of God lived through the Apostle Paul. And that's why Paul could say things like, I wish myself a curse from Christ for my brother in Israel's sake. Now, if I got up and said that, you know, if I got up and said that about Florida, if I said that about West Virginia or Georgia or whatever, you'd say, oh, bless his heart, but I know he doesn't mean it, you know. <laughs> but when Paul said it, he meant it, right? Now, how did Paul say that? He wasn't trying to have a religious spirituality contest with a, a bunch of people, you know, trying to out-fundamental each other and trying to outdo each other. Now, when he said it, it was the absolute truth. Why? Because it was God loving Israel through Paul. We talked about this morning about the more I love you, Corinth, the less I be loved. Now for recompense. He says, this is a real one-sided relationship. All I do is love and care for you and weep for you, and all you do is, you know, abuse me. All you do is say unflattering things about me. He says, the more I love you, the less I be loved. Though you have 10,000 10, instructors in Christ, you have but one Father. I beget you in the gospel. Amen. He said all those things to them. How could he do that? How could Paul put up with Corinth, not just for the 29 chapters he wrote them, but the other letters he wrote them and the trips that, and the time he spent there? How could he put up with that? You know how he did that? Because he wasn't walking after his old man. He wasn't sowing to his flesh. But it was the life of God living and loving through that man. He was a channel. There was, he was a channel, a loving channel by which the love of God was shed abroad to many, many people. Jews that hated him, despised him, laid in wait to kill him and assassinate him, and he loved them and says, I wish myself a curse from Christ for my brother in Israel's sake. And it wasn't just blowing smoke, and it wasn't just talking. It was God loving Israel through him. That's the difference between some of the religious wisdom that's been poured into us in, time, in our time past and the life of God living in us right now through his word. What a difference. What a difference the Lord Jesus Christ makes. Man's greatest possession is the Bible. The words of God made that type of difference in a man named Saul and changed him into the Apostle Paul. Our Creator has spoken His words to us. He's recorded it in a book. He's preserved it for us. And through this book, we can know His truth, His plan for today, His purpose for creation for all eternity. God has placed great and profitable things for us in His Word. But in order to get the profit out of the words that God has given us, that He's put into this book, we must study it His way. Amen? Amen. We've got to approach God's word God's way. We must follow the divinely established design for studying the Holy Scripture. That's our purpose. We won't get weary in well-doing if we're still continuing to seek God's purpose and allowing Him to live and function through us. Now, I looked on Google today. Who was it, Chase, talking about Googling things? He said he didn't know how to work it. Then he was Googling who was on the board of all the Bible translating committees. And so he's, get, he's getting the hang of it, right? So, <laughs> but uh, I tried to Google this. So since we're in Jackson, Georgia, and since I heard Atlanta's near here, um, <laughs> have you ever read this story? I've seen this in uh, illustration books for years and years. So I went and tried to find it and uh, found it recently. About a, This is years ago now, way before coronavirus. Um, a preacher was in the Atlanta area. He was in Atlanta. 
And uh, he noticed in the restaurant sections of the Yellow Pages, well, I guess from now we know this is from years ago, right? He noticed in the Yellow Pages an advertisement for the Church of God Grill. He thought it was a peculiar name, caught his, caught his attention, aroused his curiosity, so he dialed the phone number. And so a man answered with a cheery, you know, Chick-fil-A, my pleasure voice, and said, Church of God Grill. And the preacher asked how the restaurant had been given such an unusual name. And the man said, well, we had a little mission down here in the kind of a bad part of town. And we started selling chicken dinners after church on Sunday to help pay the bills and meet the expenses. Well, the people really liked our barbecued chicken. And we did such a good business that eventually we cut back on the church service. We just closed down the church altogether and kept on serving chicken dinners. And we kept the name we started with, and that's why we're called the Church of God Grill. So his finger looking good. But you know, you know what that's an example of? Forgetting your purpose. Amen? Yes. You know what that's an example of? As much as I might have a fondness for chicken grilled or fried or barbecued, you know what that is? That's sowing to your flesh. Example of that, not sowing to the Spirit. What brings the crowd? Well, in my experience, chicken. Not right division, right? <laughs> Don't forget your purpose. God saved us. God, I know I sound like a broken record. Imagine how my people feel. My people. Um, <laughs> but God created man for a, his purpose in the first place, right? God created man for a reason, not because he's lonely. Don't, let's don't talk about that. He had a reason for creating man. And I'll tell you what, he had a reason for reconciling us back to himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. The body of Christ is Jew and Gentile reconciled to God in one body. Praise the Lord for that. And now that we're in the body, we need to have the mind of the head of the body. And the only way to get that is this book that he's given us. I mean, he's inspired it. He's preserved it. We have it right now. What a blessing it is. If you'll just give it consideration, the Lord will give you understanding. And a meeting like this helps with that. Amen. Don't forget your purpose. Don't forget your purpose. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can have this time together in your word. Lord, help us not to be weary in well-doing. Help us not to follow the the majority or the trends of today of sowing to our flesh, but help us, help us to sow to our spirit. Help us to take in your spirit and to allow you to live through our everyday life. Help us to think like you'd have us to think of you and have discernment that you've given us by giving us your word. So we just thank you for that. We thank you for our Savior once again and what he accomplished for each and every one of us. His broken body, his shed blood, I was not worthy, but he made me worthy. I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that he accomplished. I thank you for the forgiveness. I thank you for the eternal reconciliation. I thank you for your word, and I pray, Father, that we'll continue in it in the days ahead. We trust you with it now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. That was a great reminder, and I uh, appreciate that. And uh, <clears throat> it's uh, as you get grounded in sound doctrine and uh, learn to rightly divide the word of truth that God wants to use you to help others that are confused and discouraged and it's um, it's not just for our own benefit it's for for serving God and um, you know in Philippians everybody calls that the joy book because the emphasis on rejoicing and joy but what really is the issue there the issue is having the mind of Christ which has to do with sacrificial service in the in the gospel ministry. And you see a lot of people are miserable in our culture, and it's because they're self-centered and they're not serving others. It's all about them. If you'll find true, real and lasting joy, it's going to come in the pathway of sacrifice and obedience and serving God. And you, as you serve God, you serve others. When you make it about yourself... You start walking after the flesh, you will faint very quickly in real ministry. You won't, you won't make it. And uh, that's why when 2 Corinthians 4, Paul, Paul talked about we faint not. He started the chapter out talking about we faint not. He ended the chapter saying we faint not. And the key is found in the middle of that chapter when he said we have this treasure in earth and vessels. That's the excellency of the power maybe of God and not of us. 
That's the whole key. It's God ministering through us. And when you make it about the Lord, you make it about others, uh, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be so joyful. And it'll be not because you were seeking after it, but because God, the, it's a fruit of the Spirit, you see. And so people get burnt out and they quit because they're trusting in their own flesh and they're trying to do things their way. But if you trust in God, depend on Him, you can be in it for the long haul, you know. And people, you know, you don't need to have uh, this thing of if it's returned to me, you know, am I getting what I ought to get out of it? It's not about you, right? When you're a real servant of the Lord, it doesn't matter if people appreciate it or not. It doesn't matter if they applaud you or not. It doesn't matter what they... It, you, People always talk about being a servant, but what happens when people treat you like one? All of a sudden, you don't like that very much. <laughs> they talk about serving the Lord, but they want to be treated like kings, you know? I remember, and I'm not going to go much longer because we're tired, I understand, but I just got to say this real quick. It just came to mind as uh, when I was in um, Vancouver for the Winter Olympics, I was on the redneck bobsled team, is what I tell people. <laughs> but we were, we were, we go when you go to an Olympic event, you get so many countries there represented, and it's a great opportunity for evangelism. So we were handing out material in different languages, and I got tied in with a group that was very organized with what they were doing. But we'd go out, and and there was a lot of us, and and I was part of it, but I was I wasn't really connected with this group. I was kind of just in on it with them, and. We'd go out all day trying to get the word out and witness to people. When we'd come back, we'd have like a rally, you know. And people were getting up just belly aching and moaning and growing. And people were rude to me. Nobody likes me and just crying about it. So I was like, I got a word I want to share. <laughs> I have a testimony. And I read from 1 Corinthians 4. Paul said, we're the filth and offscouring of all things. Okay, what do you, we're here to serve others. What do you want the world to do to applaud you because you're trying to hand out Bibles? That just goes with it. Don't get hung up on people's response. If nobody ever responds to you, there's joy in obeying God. <laughs> when you get the gospel out, it's never in vain. And by the way, you don't know what's going to happen later. Somebody might have cursed you out and then went home and got under conviction and ended up getting saved. <laughs> So you don't make it about you. You make it about the Lord. You make it about others, and you can stick with it. You know, praise the Lord. So I appreciate the messages, and I hope you'll be back in the morning. At uh, if you want to uh, participate with the breakfast, uh, we'll have that again at nine. It start at nine, anytime between nine and ten. But we're going to start in here at ten, and uh, and then also at eleven, we'll finish up and we'll have lunch again. So plenty of opportunity for more preaching and fellowship tomorrow. Let's stand if you would, please. I've enjoyed the day. Um, there's no better thing, I think, than when we can get around the Word of God together and fellowship in the faith and just, it's been a blessing. It's been a, even though I'm tired because it's been a long day, it's been so encouraging. Uh, I feel strengthened by it and I praise the Lord for it. So, hope to see you in the morning and uh, so we'll be dismissed in prayer. Brother Donnie, way back there, could you pray for us, please? Amen.